<laughs> All right, welcome to ECON 2011, Basic Microeconomics. If you are in the wrong room, now is the time to quietly go out. Um, okay, wow, we have a lot of students just here. So, oh, wrong name. We're going to change that in a moment. Uh, so, my name is Vinci Cha. Um, so my email address is finchichao.edu.hk. My office, oh, office is actually this type. It's 1014, not 100, wait a minute. No, 1004, yes, that's fine. And so my office is 1004, Esther Lee Building. And the purpose of this course is an overview of microeconomics at the undergraduate level. Now look at it. Didn't I just saw you this morning? Okay, so apparently a lot of you are actually ah. I, I, now I know why so many people are willing to en enroll in the eight thirty class. Now, typically, eight thirty class are very unpopular because you have to wake up at like what seven. So undergraduates don't like that, right? But now, but it's surprisingly full now because oh, that's because you can fit everything into one day and then you get four days off. <laughs> Undergraduate life. So what do you expect from this course? The course workload is three to four assignments used for tie breaking in assigning course grades. So what that means? It means that if you perform so well that you're going to get an A anyway, it doesn't actually affect anything. Mostly what it does is that if you're on the margin between C plus and B minus, then it's going to make a big difference. So the assignments are there for tie breaking. Ah, you just, so you're allowed to submit it in submit the assignments in groups of up to three students, up to three. So four is not fine. Two is okay. And you can always submit on your own, right? One, two, three, not four. Okay. Why, oops, why, why do I allow you to submit in groups? Well, I mean, practical, I mean, realistically, even if I don't allow you to submit in groups, it will practically be in groups anyway, right? I don't expect that I have 120 students, I'm going to get 120 <coughs> distinct copies of the assignments. That usually never happens. So you might as well allow you to submit in groups, so you don't need to copy, and then the TAs don't need to grade 120 copies of identical problem sets. So we're going to allow you to submit up to three students each. Uh, we're going to, so the assignments and the lecture slides, everything will be on eLearn, like tonight. So I'm going to, so the site is not up yet, but it will be up tonight. Um, the assignments usually we will give you somewhere around one to one and a half week to complete. The in-class midterm, uh, we have a very big class, so we might need to uh, schedule another room, like two rooms, because it would be better if you, if you don't need to be so crammed into a single room to take the midterm. So that's going to be on, when is it going to be? Midterm. What did I say? 18? Okay, the midterm is going to be on the 18th. October 18th? October 18th. October 18th. All right. So you should mark the date now. The midterm is going to be in the October 18th in class. So you want to be here on time. Final exam will be centrally arranged, which means we don't know the exact date and time until a much later date. Once again, as I would always tell all the exchange students, uh, we can't guarantee that you can leave early because it's centrally arranged by university. So you simply have to wait till the university announce the examination dates before you book your plane tickets. That's just the way it works. Um, so the course website, as I said, will be up by tonight. Um, okay, so because I have back-to-back -back classes in the morning. <laughs> I forgot to actually type in the TA's name in the slide. So the TA should, un should introduce themselves to you. All right, you should introduce yourself. Ladies first. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jiang Ping, and I'm an MPU PhD student in the Econ department. And my office is at, on the 
I went to California. Good. All right. So um, the names and the the, the teaching assistants' names, offices and uh, office hours, so on. I would post on eLearn too. So you can email them. You can visit them during the office hours for any questions you have. All right. So. All right. So first, what is economics? What is economics? How many of you have taken economics in secondary school? Yeah. Uh, a lot of you. All right. Let's go the other way around. Who haven't actually taken economics before? Hmm, very few of you. All right, so this question is actually very boring in this case because if you have already taken economics in secondary school, your answers will be highly uncreative. So usually I want students to write down what they think economics is in one sentence, but in my experience, if you have a whole class full of students who have already taken secondary school economics, everyone would say economics is study of allocation of resources, blah, 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 blah. So it's not very interesting. Now, let me start this way. When people, when the most common question I get in Hong Kong, at least, when I when I tell people that I study economics is, which stock should I buy? My big tech hole. What's he on the mail guy? Right. It's all right. So if I know, I'll be rich, and I don't need to teach you anymore. Economics is not just finance, right? Although we do offer courses in financial economics. And that the, in, if you study courses in the finance department, if you, will find, you will see that financial <coughs> theories are very much based on economic theories. Economists study a lot more than just finance. Isn't money related? Some people would say it's like money, right? Study of how money is used. Well, not necessarily. Have you anyone read the book for economics? So if you read for economics, you, have, you would know that there are economists engaging in research in things like how, as how crime rate is affected by abortion rates. Now that's not very directly money related. You can say with less crime, with a lower crime rate, people won't like have things stolen, and maybe that saves them some money. But it's not directly related to money. Like my PhD dissertation is actually about World of Warcraft. I study whether undergraduate students like you play too much. What do you think? Maybe today, World of Warcraft won't be the best example. Maybe we should use something like Pokemon Go. How much time do you spend on Pokemon Go like in the past few months? Right? Um, another way of saying maybe it's the study of choices and incentives. Um, and that might include the development of tools, like mathematical tools to study. Although there are economists who basically focus on statistics. Uh, in economics, we call it econometrics. So it's very hard to define what economists do. And if you're an economics major, as you study, you realize that the topics, there are so many topics to study. Right. Um, ah, OK, so here's about I hate about PowerPoint. That whenever I, if I ever click the back button to erase whatever I record. So OK, I'm just going to record at home what I just said again. And just you, would not, you wouldn't know from the recording that I actually accidentally press the back button or something. So eco economics is somewhere around here. On one hand, you have economists to, that engage in very applied research. Very applied research that focus on studying actual data. Like, does more education give you higher, does more education gives you a higher income in the future? On the other hand, there are economists that study much more theoretical stuff. Things like, do you know what you want? Do you? Do you know? Well, maybe if you maybe you say, oh, of course, I want. I, I know what I want right now. But do you know what you want in ten years? Now, that's what sounds like a very theoretical questions have very big implications when it comes to investment. 
if you do not know what you want in 10 to 20 years, how, do you, how are you supposed to invest in your retirement savings? In particular, if you think you don't need a lot of money when you are old, well, then, then first, it's wrong. Second, that's what people do, so they don't save. And then, that has great implications on welfare policies. Right? In Hong Kong, we're talking about it right now. Should there be like universal retirement benefits? Huge issue. Who pays for it? It's so much money. So if people, if people don't know what they want, it's a really big question. Another way of looking at what economists do <coughs> okay, why does it have to be so tight? You know, right. Another way of looking at what economists do is what, how we study econ economics. First is theory. Most commonly referred to as math. Uh, some people would say, well, the economics education is kind of cheat, um, cheating, right? In secondary school, when you study economics, Theory means we give you a really pretty idea of what's going on, described by words, right? But in, once you get to university, theory suddenly becomes math. And a lot, for a lot of students who, who came from like an arts background, it's very hard to adapt. Unfortunately, that's how it works. Uh, if you want to blame, blame someone like Alfred Marshall, who died like many, many years ago, like who somehow managed to change economics into a much more quantitative field. But there's also empirical investigation. Getting data, studying it with statistical methods. That's econometrics. As I mentioned in the math course just now, students hate, the only thing that students hate more than math is econometrics. Statistical methods are inherently difficult. So uh, it's, some, but it's one of the things that's very useful that comes out of economics as a field. So it's something that you should always consider if you are interested in economics. Finally, you have things like policy implications that might have real-world impacts. Right now, the threat that the United States Federal Reserve would have to decide whether to keep interest rate low. And the, uh, there's a big market betting for or against whether, they, whether the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rate or not. If you, have, if you have heard every word uttered by the chair, chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, it's interpreted by the market and it affects stock market, it affects currencies, it affects commodities. So it's a very important decision. Should land be auctioned in fixed quantities every year? In Hong Kong, we kind of go back and forth. Sometimes, it will, sometimes the, argu the argument goes for auctioning land regularly. Sometimes it goes the other way around. Well, maybe you should. We should only sell land if someone actually, if some developer actually says they want it. Which one is right? Which one is better? In secondary school, economics is just composed of microeconomics and macroeconomics. In university, it's a lot more complicated. Within microeconomics, there are topics that study individual choices. There are there are things that study how prices are determined. That's the topic of industrial organization, industrial organization and financial asset pricing. There are, there are, there are fields that study taxes, subsidies, quotas, that's public economics, work and education related, labor economics. In macroeconomics, where you study aggregate behaviors, <coughs> there, you, some people study monetary and physical policies and some study trade and exchange policy rates, that's international economics. In, in university, each of these topics are a separate course. So there are many different topics that you can study, and we have teachers specialized in each area that teach you on that topic. So, in this course, what we cover? Simplified foundational theories. So, um, we will keep the math to a relatively low level. So all we need is plus, minus, like basic, ar basic, arithmetic, basic arithmetic. So we don't use calculus. <laughs> we will talk about policy implications. <coughs> Textbook is not required. 
the publisher the, the publisher's sales lead is not here, so I can say that it's not required. Um, so the course is self-contained. So the material we you see in class will be will all will be what I test you on in the exams. So you can still buy the textbook. Uh, you can still buy the textbook. Uh, it might help you understand the topics better, but um, and I'm, I'm, but it's not necessary. And another possibility you can consider is go to the library and just find a previous edition of any microeconomics textbook. Microeconomics is a very standardized topic. Pretty much any textbook you pick up will have exact same content. This is very different from macroeconomics, which depends a lot on the school of thoughts. So for microeconomics, you can you can certainly just pick up an old copy, and it will work. As I said, mentioned already, form a core concept to exams. Now, to begin, I would want <coughs> I want to introduce you to uh, how economists consider some uh, what they want to study. For example. Suppose you believe that small investors make systematic mistakes, right? You see that the stock market moves around, it looks how like it's very complicated. Do people make the make correct decisions? How do you test this? How do you know that people are making decis correct decisions or not? Um, if you're talking about something that happens in the real world, right? This is something you can observe, people investing. Let's actually look at people investing. And something that is very interesting in Hong Kong is if you're not local, you probably don't know what's going on. But for so if you go to a typical bank in Hong Kong, they would have an area where they have stock hold machines. You see the monitor here? These are stock hold machines set up for their clients to use. And who uses those machines? Now you're not gonna see someone like my age or your age going there. You know, you're gonna see people like uh, these ladies. Where they are probably in their at least their fifties or sixties, and they spend all day long, and you you would come to appreciate how fast they type. Like they just keep having like different stock quotes, very very like very quickly. So, are they investing correctly? Now, some of us there certainly there's certainly a good number of you studying studying economics because you are interested in finance, right? Some of you definitely do. So this is a topic that's very interesting. Do he, so do spending time, do spending so much time on investment actually makes you a better investor? And this is a question that is actually considered by a very uh, uh, PhD student in US in one of the very famous schools, UC Berkeley. Uh, over all, uh, over the, like it's almost two decades now. And he's now a very famous professor, obviously. And well, how did he study? How did he study this topic? He managed to find a very, he managed to get data from a brokerage firm, like a stock trading firm, of a, for many many small investors. And how do you manage to do that? Right, it's very private information. He did that by playing tennis with the boss of the company. So this is this. Lesson is that the lesson here is that we never know what skill is useful. You should, so you should better practice your golf or something. It could help you one day. So, um, so what did he find? Um, uh, I'm going to save what he find for later, for um, slightly later. Uh, I'm just going to close this list for now. You ask me another question first. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Another question is asked is. Well, let's say you have ten dollars to split with a classmate in this class. We just going to do this. Think about this hypothetically. I'm not actually going to put ten dollars out. Do I have ten dollars in my pocket? Well, I mean, okay, I do have ten dollars in my pocket. It's like even like a ooh, this. This is even like a green ten dollar, which in Hong Kong, this is like this is dated back from this. Is, let's see, when this when was this? This is actually from 1992, back when Hong Kong was still a colony, which is why you see, you know, you have this like, you have this like crown on the logo, right? Now it can't exist anymore. It had to be a flower because now we have returned to China. So let's say you have ten dollars. 
If you don't know who, then you're going to split it with a classmate, right? And you get to decide how much you want to give. You do not know who the other student is because if it's your friend, then you probably behave differently than if someone that you don't know. Let's just say someone you don't know, but you know it's inside the classroom. Catch is, even though you get to decide how much to give, if the other student rejects your offer, neither of you gets anything, right? So if you offer something and the other student accepts, good, the money is split accordingly. But if the student rejects your offer, then neither of you gets any. So the money goes back to me. Okay. What I want you to ask is, can you so write down on your notebook or, or a sheet of paper, how much do you actually want to offer in this case? Given that if the, if the offer is rejected, you get nothing. How much would you offer? How much do you offer? Just write it down. Right. It's always very interesting to see. Although it's not as interesting because you have so we have, you have too many students who have studied economics before. In the past, where you have like maybe a third of the students who have never studied economics, the answer is usually very different from those who have. But all, almost all of you have studied economics, so it's not as interesting. Okay, let's see. students would actually write $10. How many, who are you? Anyone's going to reject a $10 offer? <laughs> like, now let's think about this carefully. What should a completely selfish person do? If, I, if you're truly completely selfish, just care about how much money you get. What, what's the minimum you should accept? You should accept, actually, you should accept anything, right? If you really care about how much money you get, one dollar is one dollar more than nothing. If you reject, you get nothing. Yet, this game where we just think, just kind of consider, have been played with real money, sometimes a lot of money, in in experiments conducted by economists, and you almost never get anyone to accept that, as little as one dollar. Typically, you will need somewhere around four to five dollars in order for people to start accepting offers. And now this is something very puzzling. If you if you if you look at the perspective that people are selfish, that's what you're being taught in secondary school, right? Economics, we assume people are self-interested. And if you're they're truly so self-interested, why don't they accept the money? Yet, on the other hand, intuitively you do understand that offering one dollar will not be accepted, right? Which is why so many of you have put down four to five dollars. So intuitively, you do know some that humans will not accept an offer so low. Why? Now you have to think about, is self-interest a reasonable assumption? 
the fact the rejection of a small amount of money would seem to go against your self-interest of any money. What's happening? Is this self-interest that is in question, or is the scope of self-interest that is in concern? Maybe self-interest is not the same as earning as much money as possible. Right? You care more about just money. And then it leads to the question, you know, let's say things like, what's the motivation behind donation? Can self-interest people donate money? Yes or no? Yeah. Can you can you have any can you point to any evidence of that? That self extremely self interested Even even if we assume, even if we assume people are extremely self interested can they donate money? Yeah. Why? How? Right. Can you have do you have any example of that? Of course, you have an example. You are sitting right inside the example. This is called the this is called YIA, Yatsumoto International Park. What do you think Yatsumoto is? <laughs> Obviously it's a it's a person who has donated money. Right? It's actually all over CUHK is example. At ELB, Esther Lee Building, who is Esther Lee? Esther Lee is oh right. so it's obvious Esther Lee is a person that actually I think Esther Lee is the wife of the one who did donate money. Right. So and even in the case, in places like United States. You have Rockefeller buildings. You have you you have Trump towers. <laughs> like people do things because they want their names on, on to be seen. So even extremely self-interested people can donate money. But we're not saying that that's what they are doing. That's the reason behind. It. There are people who truly may be concerned about well-being of people. But what are they trying to do? Are they trying to maximize the minimum the minimum individual income? Like they kind of like a kind of like a they want to lift the boat, right? And try to make everyone better off. Are they trying to minimize the difference in individual wealth? Like kind of a social are they socialists? They're trying to make peace, they're trying to minimize difference in the society. Now notice that these two motivations are different, right? Because when facing a situation where you can make one person you can make one person 1,000 times richer and the, the rest of us maybe two times richer. Someone who's interested in maximizing individual wealth would find that a pretty good deal. Whereas someone who's going to want to minimize the difference between individuals would find that a really bad deal. Right? So what drives, the most, what drives people in donating money and, setting and, and pursuing social objectives? Something that economists have studied. Economists, so economists have actually tried running like um, donation campaigns discreetly, just trying to see why, what what people want, what what's motivating people. So here's how it works. One, let's say you're okay. This is talking about some that like, suburban United States, right? I think it's his, um, more precisely suburban Chicago or something, not talking about Hong Kong. So let's just say one day you, you hear the doorbell rings at, in your. In, okay, one day actually, no. Let's say one day you go home, you find that there's a lift leaflet on your door telling you that next week a certain charitable organization is going to come to your door to raise some money for like a children's hospital or something. It's a very tra it's a it's a legitimate charitable cause, but and so and the leaflet tells you next week somebody's gonna come by. Okay, next week comes. So and so you have this you have this person you have this um like this representative from the charitable organizations coming in ringing the doorbell. Now the question is, do you think it's more likely the door will be answered? when there's a leaflet, or is the door is more likely to be answered with a leaflet? If I leave a leaflet telling you there's going to be donation next week, is, are you more likely to be at home or not? That tells a lot about what's your motivation for donation, right? If you're truly concerned about helping out others, the fact that I tell you there's going to be a donation next week makes you more likely to be at home. But if you're all, if you if you kind of like, uh, Donate money, yeah, I should do that, but I don't actually want to. What will you do? You actually 
intentionally go out, right? Because, oh, I really want to donate money, but I just happen to have to go out to do something else, right? So that's how economists have come have to test what motivation of people. Okay, so if you're, if you're interested, that, that we can talk, we will talk more about that. In today, today, we're going to talk about some basic principles in economics. Fundamental to all analysis, we, can, we pretty much assume that these could be given. The first is scarcity. The first is scarcity. That every desirable thing has a limited availability. So you can't have everything you want. So, okay, so examples. So, for example, like, not, no, not, so, uh, I have changed the example. In the previous years, in the previous years, I usually use uh, the class, use the class enrollment as an example. But then, for a few years, the, the economics department was not very popular, and we never managed to fill our space. So it's not actually scarce. <laughs> you can have pretty much enter the class anytime you want. But this year, for some reason, now the class is almost full. So I can use this example again, right? This class is 130 seats. Not everyone can get in. We have, what, three seats left, maybe? Probably going to be filled up eventually. Um, iPads. Despite high demand, only 9.3 only million iPads were available between April and July in 2011. 9.3 sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. When you think about it, it's a global launch with a lot of people interested in it. Uh, and so Tencent. Tencent is a, so it's a Chinese telecommunications company. It's a maker of WeChat. Kind of like we, kind of like WhatsApp, just with more features. They have nine, five point three nine billion of ten cent shares in trade. Once again, that sounds like a lot, but it's actually not a lot when you think about how many people want it. So it's actually in, it's the prices have been going up by a lot. And scarcity implies trade-off. You can't have everything. You can't. You, there's you don't you don't have the ability to get everything you want. Some students won't be able to get into this course. Not everyone who line up will get an iPad, and not everyone will be a stockholder of Tencent. Uh, in fact, I think uh, companies like for Tencent in particular, a large part of the stock is not actually publicly traded, so that makes it even harder to get one. So, who makes the trade off and how they make is what economists spend a lot of time studying. Now, uh, in the case of the of this course. In the case of this course, uh, there are priorities and limits. There are priorities and limits. You have, since you're all here, you have all experienced thesis. Thesis is a very nice name uh, in amongst just local students. It's called thesis mother. <laughs> yeah, or mother thesis. I think mother thesis is actually better. Just think about a swear word in English. Start with, that starts with mother, and exact has that exact same meaning, mother thesis. Because the competition for courses is so intense, students are fighting to get into the system to enroll. And what happens when so many people want to use the system? The system crash. When the system crash, you can't enroll. And then the next time you lock in, the haha, all the courses you want have already been already filled. So people, like, mm, not surprised when people <coughs> swear. What do I have to tell you? You should be, you should be happy that at least you get an online system to enroll. Think about what happens before people can, people can enroll online. Let me tell you what happens when I was a first year undergraduate. The, somehow the university still hasn't used an uh, online system yet, and I study in a place that snows. So every, so when people need to enroll courses for the second term, you actually have to line up in in the snow. Early, like way early in the morning, and then at exactly the time that you can start enrolling, people will start rushing into a gymnasium, scrambling for like chops that actually gives you the right to enroll in the course. It's surprising that no one actually dies from that. Like, I mean, standing in the cold, I like, think about it how much time is it? Like, if you want to get into a popular course, you have to stand there for hours. Apple, you support your first come first serve either by lining up. 
or by and by trying to click into their website and trying to enroll them. That's different from how CUHK works, right? Because CUHK we actually give priorities to people. Fourth year gets to go go first, followed by third year, second year. Freshman, sorry, you're screwed. That's how it works. The, the most interesting of all, at least the economists, is the market. Stock, stock market is one example, is that things goes to the highest bidder. Now we're gonna talk about why the market is preferable in a particular sense. Why would it be preferable for desirable items to go to the highest bidder? Exactly what that means, we, we will talk about somewhere in the fifth or sixth class. So each individual has to make trade-offs. You want to get good grades, if you want to get good grades, you, you have to study. You have to, maybe you want all, well, some students. So you have, there are two ways you can get a good grade. One, you study hard. Second, you try to enroll in courses that give good grades. Um, I think the second is very common among the students in the department. Right? So, which is why the university forces us to curve this curve. We, so in a class this big, the university limits the number of A and A minus to 25% at most. Well, no matter how well everyone does, it's still going to be at most 25%. That's just the way the university sets the limit. Uh, you have to practice some of your skills. That means you can't spend as much time doing something else, right? You can't play, you can't just keep playing, you can't just keep sleeping, you have to spend time studying and practicing. If you want a knife, you have to line up early. This is actually a photo I took during the launch of iPad 2. Not iPad Air 2, but iPad 2. Okay? You probably don't know what that is. Right? iPad 2. That's a long ago. This is actually um, this is actually in uh, somewhere near San Francisco. San Francisco. Um, you can't see the Apple store because it's still probably a kilometer away. Like somewhere here, you might actually see the Apple logo. Let's find it. And it's not like I'm late. This is like two hours ago. Two hours ago. Needless to say, I didn't manage to get one that day, but well, I mean, at least you get a picture that I've been used for teaching for a long time. <laughs> uh, to, like, something I should mention is that. Um, Chinese students, Chinese students are very good at making trade, how to kind of maximize, maximize their time and make the best trade off they possibly could. A lot of the, a lot of people lining up are, uh, were Chinese students, like students who were studying in San Francisco. And how, now you know you're gonna line up ready for a long time, right? How do you make sure your time is not waste? For locals, for locals, you friends, you have you come with some friends, you chit chat, and you kind of spend the time, you spend the time together. Not for Chinese students. Chinese students bring their homework, so they stand in line and they'll do their homework like that for two hours, <laughs> at least. Oh, yeah. <coughs> there's and there's well, there's always the option of spending more money too, right? Now, you you want. If you if you if you actually if you actually have a market, then you have the option of spending more money. For Apple, uh, there's a, there's a gray market, but not an official market. But in the stock market, you actually legally you just need to pay money, right? If you want to buy shares at a certain price, you, and you can't do it, you can always raise your offer until someone's willing to sell. Another option is to wait for it to become cheaper. Which one do you want to do? Now, trade-off means there's cost to doing things, right? Cost of an iPad is the alternative use of the price. That's one. How much does iPads cost? iPad costs something like three thousand eight hundred eighty-eight dollars, something like that in Hong Kong. Uh, so, if you buy an iPad, you have you have the money you spend on the iPad cannot be used on something else. But that's not the only cost of an iPad. Because if you have to wait in line, that's cost. Now, uh, where is in today, actually, or tomorrow? Apple is going to review the iPhone 7. 
Time to get in line again. <laughs> and now I'm telling you, time in line is time is money, right? Time is money. If you have to wait in line for two hours, is that worthwhile? It's probably worthwhile for most people, but it's not worthwhile for say the like the like say Li Ka Sheng, the richest man in Hong Kong. He's not going to line up for two hours, even if he wants an iPhone, right? So. Cost of buying Tencent, price of shares. If you spend some, you spend money on buying the shares, but that's not the only cost. Whenever you trade, you have to pay the brokerage that helps you transact a commission. Furthermore, if you buy Tencent, that means you're probably not buying something else. If you're not buying something else, you're not getting. The best return you might have from safe money, right? If you don't buy ten cent and buy, for for example, Alibaba or something, right? Maybe you get high return from Alibaba. <coughs> then you would not you not be maximizing your return, right? Now the cost of enrolling in this course is that you're not going to enroll in the next best course you would have attended, right? The cost of coming to CHK is not even not going to HKU. Right. So you have trade-off. You can't be enrolled in two, two universities at the same time. Then which how do you pick? So it's important to recognize the two costs. In particular, cost is not limited to the price tag. And this is where I go back to what I've mentioned. This investor return, investment returns. It turns out that commission is the is the biggest determinant of your stock return. Not your stock picking skills, but commission. How do we know that? Yeah. Remember the, the, the remember how um, I mentioned the, this famous professor now. He collects all these data for small investors, and this is the diagram he produced in his very famous paper. This is bar. It's a bar. It's a it's a bar. It's a bar chart. It's a bar chart, right? It's not really something very complicated, but it's re but it's very easy to understand. What is what's the conclusion is? So on starting on the right hand side, this is S and P five hundred index fund. So S and P five hundred, as you know, is the index in the, is one of the major indexes in the United States, just like Hang Seng Index in Hong Kong. The white bar is the gross annual and uh, gross percentage annual return. It's, so it's like so this is um the, so on average. During that period, the gross return of, of the, the United States stock market is around 17 or 18 percent. Okay? Okay. Annually, you get around 17 to 18 percent from the stock market annually. Well, that's way deep. This, this paper is published in USD 2000, so it's way before financial crisis, which is why it's so high. The black bar is net return, net of the cost of trading. Now, it's very low, as you can see, the red bar and the white bar is very close, which means the stock market return and the trade and the stock market return is very close to the return you get after subtracting trading costs. The reason is most of the most of these days, you don't if you want to buy this whole stock market, like if you want to get a record, you want to buy every stock in, available in the stock market, you don't actually need to go out to do that yourself. You can buy what's called ETF, exchange traded exchange trader funds, which gives you which basically you buy it's like a single stock and it already contains all the other stocks. So this is why it's the trading cost is very low. In Hong Kong, you can get two. Anyone know what's the ETF for Hang Seng Index? Is anyone who's like a no, like a skill person, like a someone who's very good at stock trading in secondary school already? No one? Really? Okay, so in Hong Kong, if you want to buy Hang Seng Index, the local stock market index, you, you, what, you, what, you buy, what you do is you buy the, you, you buy the um, tracking fund of Hong Kong, Yang Fu Gei Gap, the Batman Lang, 2800. The number is very, you know, the number is like kind of fortune number, A, this A means prosperity, so 2800 means easy prosperity or something like that. Okay, so 
That's, it's, that's what you do in Hong Kong. You can buy E2800 and it gives you, give you a share of the stock market. Easy to do. Now, moving towards individual return. Now, average individual. This is the average return. The data, the data shows what investors get. Right far, this is the gross return from their stock holding, which is pretty high. It's actually even higher than the market. So it looks like the investors do have some idea what stock to pick. Okay, that's good. The black, but unfortunately, the black bar is lower than the stock, the stock market as a whole. Which means the problem after you consider how much it take, how much cost it takes to trade. They actually, you're actually getting a lower return. Now, why is that the case? Let's split the data into five groups. One is people who trade very little, like once a year. Five is people who trade daily. Okay, these are called day traders. Let's see what, what do you see. Now, the white bar represents the return of the stocks they hold. And that's pretty much constant. Trading more often doesn't make you earn necessarily earn more money. But what? But look at the black bar. The black bar represents the profit, the return after paying for the trans commission, and it's going down very steeply as you trade more. They're going down steeply as you trade more. And if you look at how much they trade, the the gray bar is how much they trade. It's not surprising. It's like the, it's not surprising. For people who trade very little, you're trading once a year. For first people who are trading daily, you're talking about like two, in an average stock market, you have at least 200 trading days. If you buy and sell in the same day, then you have 400 trades. Because every time you buy and sell, you have to pay commission. So it's not surprising that you have to pay a lot of money in commission. If you're in Hong Kong, you buy five stocks. Typically, commission is in the amount of 0. Point something percent. So it's less than one percent usually. Unfortunately, there is only also always a minimum charge, like say a hundred dollars. Now, if the minimum commission is a hundred, you're not going to buy like two hundred dollars worth of shares, right? It's going to just eat into your profit. So, but this, so it's the same idea here. Trading is actually very expensive behavior. The more you trade, the more you pay in commission, and on average, you don't earn more. So the first lesson in finance is. Do not trade off. Do not trade often. Yeah. And the second lesson in finance is buy the market. If you study financial theory, this is what you would just you this is what you would, you would get. Theoretically, it's very there's a very there's very sound reason why buying the market is going to give you the best give you the best return in some sense. It's going to be best return in some sense. So that's something you can, if you're interested, study financial economics, study, study, study a course in finance. So, principle two, course is what you have given up, and that's called opportunity cost in economics. What you have given up. And it includes more than just the price tag. So, now let's think about buying an iPad. Uh, so, uh, um, let's say you have three models, 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes, and 64 gigabytes. And let, so 16 gigabytes is 3,888, 30 gigabytes is 4,688, and 64 gigabytes is 5,488. How do you approach this problem? If you think about the problem this way, buying an iPad is not a binary decision, right? You're not saying, uh, oh, I want to buy an iPad, and that's it. You have to also consider what, what model to buy. Once upon a time, the decision is quite simple. When I first, I mean, when I first start teaching, right, the iPad you only have a single color and a single like and different memory size. That's it. And back then, there's also like what maybe one one of there's just like iPhone is very simple too. Like you have black, and then then it comes black and white. How many models of iPhone do we have right now? Let's just start with. The, just start with iPhone 6s. You have space gray, white, gold, rose gold, right? And then you have 
like what different memories, like three, three different memory types. And then additional to that, you have 6S, which duplicates all of that. And then you have item SE, which, which is a complete, a complete separate line. Anyone know how many models you can get with item 7? So that, like, this is a test of geekiness. How close do you follow techni tech like, technique? No one else? Okay. The rumor is that there's going to be why this could not this that just there's no more gray. There's going to be um there's going to be a some sort of a metallic black, white, gold, rose gold, and a piano black. <laughs> <laughs> more choices, right? More choices. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Like some some like the some Apple fans would say like um. Like Steve Jobs is probably going to be probably going to die again, even if he if he wakes up today, right? What? You have so much, so much, so I used to have this all this simplicity, and now you have this bloated system or bloated portfolio stuff to buy. When you have so many choices, how do you make decisions? To make it simple, let's just consider the case where you have mem different memory different memory size. Because if you want, you want to consider different colors, it's just more complicated. But let's just consider the case where you have three different memory sites, and then you can line it up very clearly, right? Do you want more memory? That's the question. Do you want more memory? And if you want to pin the number, then you can look at it this way. Is the iPad with this first 16 gigabyte of memory worth $3,888? If it's not, you don't even need to consider the next model, right? It's not even worthwhile for you. So if it does, then you want to consider, are you willing to pay another $800 for 16 gigabytes? Yes or no? That brings you to 32 gigabytes of memory. And if it does, then you think about it again, is the, is another, is the third and the fourth 16 gigabytes worth another $800? Now this is about whether it's worthwhile to you, because it's, not, it's completely not about cost. Memory is cheap. <coughs> 16 gigabyte memory does not cost 800 Hong Kong dollars to manufacture. This is this is Apple knowing that some people are willing to pay money for more money. Principle three in economics: think at the margin. This is what we so what we call thinking at the margin is rational individuals weighting incremental benefits against corresponding incremental costs. You're always thinking about incrementals, which is why, which is what we call margins, right? This the frontier. So, uh, when you thinking, when you thinking about buying an iPad, you're thinking about sixteen gigabyte, yes, no, and another sixteen gigabyte, yes, no, another sixteen gigabyte, yes, no. So you're always thinking incremental, sixteen, fifty-two, sixty-four, and so on. So that's called thinking at a margin. Where do people actually view so is controversial? In this example, I think it does make sense. When people think about buying an iPad, they do think, and or an iPhone, they do think about the trade-off in terms of memory size, right? When you buy a, when you buy computers, you think about speed. When you buy, when you buy like packages, I don't know. At least for me, when I buy like when I buy snacks, I always look at, I always look at the weight and the weight, whether you actually get the best deal. Like, or when you buy like, um, no. In Hong Kong, we like paper packs of of drinks, right? Paper pack of drinks. Sometimes they come in packs of six, and sometimes they come in packs of nine. Which one is cheaper? They usually they are, they want, so sometimes the six pack is cheaper, sometimes the nine pack is cheaper. So, do people actually make those calculations for something as expensive as an iPad, or something as expensive as an apartment building, an apartment, uh, apartment? Public. Like, like buying drinks. It's already not not too clear. Now, <coughs> uh, example that is to illustrate this this uh, whether people people would do this is uh, how would Gary Becker brush his teeth? Uh, Gary Becker is a Nobel laureate in uh, in two thousand and two. He is a Chicago economist, famous for applying economic rationality to. to we do topics that we con traditionally consider <coughs> not in the realm of economics. For example, um, marriage and payment. 
how do you decide how you pick a girlfriend? How do you, how do you, how do you guy decides to pick a girlfriend? Now, if you're studying psychology, you would think maybe something about like you, may, you think that maybe there's some chemistry. But, and if you if you study sociology, maybe there will be or anthropology, there will be like traditions and so on. Not for Gary Becker. Gary Becker is an economist. It's very simple. Like we can quantify how good a how good a potential. Uh, we could quantify how good a female is down to a number. Every female will have a number. Bigger means better. When a guy wants to find a girlfriend, he's going to go out, look at everything, look at, look at the first girl, and say, "Okay, he's a five. What can I find better than? Can I find someone better than five? If I do, I move on to the next one. Next one is a seven. Can I find a better than seven? Yes. Then if it, yes, then I could move on again. No, then I just stick with the girl and start dating, and perhaps marry. That's that's the men, that's the, the logic." That Gary Becker applies to marriage, and so it's very rational, right? It's it's just like it's just like if you're, you're picking a picking a girlfriend, like you're picking a picking a stock or picking like what would like what's what's the what's the best what's the best watermelon to buy from the supermarket, right? People do people do that? Like do people do that? Another example is Gary Becker applied the, the same idea to um, crime. Why would criminal commit crime? Well, once again, if you're a psychologist, maybe you have some theories about what, how, what, what, how, what, what, what were they thinking, and you're studying sociology, so maybe you think about how, how society is affected. Not for economists. Economists say, well, when, when, you, when the criminals wait the benefit of committing a crime against the cause of committing a crime. What's the cause of committing a crime? The possibility of getting caught multiplied by the, the punishment you can accept. So people commit crimes when punishment is not severe enough or they, not, or they think they're not going to get caught and so on. So this is what Gary Becker does. Applying economic thinking to fields that you might not have thought belonging to economics initially. So he, another very famous economist, Gary, uh, George Akerlof, Nobel laureate in 2011. Um, so uh, Gary Becker was one of the teachers that I studied under when I was in graduate school. Uh, Akerlof is a very interesting person, right? Now the photo looks like he's like kind of like serious guy. Uh, he is the husband, actually, he's the husband of the current chairwoman of the Federal Reserve. So Janet Yellen, is, uh, Janet Yellen and Akerlof are married. So Akerlof, he looks serious guy, but he actually sounds nothing like that. Uh, he actually has a very high pitch, like he's just like, ah, like this is how you teach. Really, he, he's like, he, that's how he sounds. You can't, completely can't tell from that. And he's a, what you call relatively a behavioral economist. Like he emphasizes a lot on people's somewhat, we would say, irrational behavior. And so to so he so Gary, uh, George Akerlof made fun of Gary Becker one uh, in one day. He actually made fun of him in front of the students. And what he did is he came in in pajamas with the toothpaste and was saying like, "What would Gary Becker do if he's brushing his teeth in the morning?" Now, remember, people make decisions incrementally, right? So when you apply toothpaste to your toothbrush, what are you supposed to do if you are an economist? The, when, you, when you put toothpaste on your toothbrush, initially, obviously the benefit of toothpaste is better than the cost of toothpaste, right? Without toothpaste, then you're not really effectively brushing your teeth, so you have to put toothpaste. So you have to, so you, you so you start putting toothpaste. It, it's benefit bigger than cost. Let's continue. As you put more toothpaste, then you you be mentally you should be evaluating the benefit versus the cost of that drop of toothpaste. You should, and as you go, you should only stop when the benefit of the last drop of toothpaste exactly equals to the cost of the toothpaste, right? Then you're breaking even, and you should not apply more toothpaste. That's what you can't. That's what Gary Becker suggests people do. Do you do that every morning? You study economics, right? You should start thinking about whether you're applying too much toothpaste because 
if you apply, if you apply like a one drop more than every single day, 365 days, you probably get a two, a grand, you get a whole tube of toothpaste for free. Do you do that? No, no one does that. I hope no one does that. Like, so the thing is, keep with, even though e commerce applies to your thinking of you know, this thinking at the margin concept to everything you study, in the next four years, whatever economics course you study, we always apply this way of thinking. People always think at the margin. That doesn't mean that is the right assumption for everything. For many decisions, probably people just don't do that. Okay. Now, well, I don't like these type of um so we have right now what we have right now is a two one a two one arrangement, right? We have two hours today and actually we don't we have like forty five minutes on Thursday. I don't and the in some other in at the other arrangement available in the university is like a three uh, like a three hour long lecture. Uh, that I usually like more because you can easily you can eat, you know, more easily arrange what to teach in this in this in a two one arrangement. The forty five minutes on Thursday is kind of like just difficult. It's short, so you can't teach a lot of stuff. Uh, it's, it gives, it's like it, you know, it forces you to come back for forty five minutes, <laughs> just for just for just because we have we have course we have course uh, we have um, class. So unfortunately, uh, we should, so that probably means we're not going to take a break. Well, we have half an hour to go, so we should be so let's just keep going. If we uh, if we manage to finish everything, then we can be, we can end early. But usually it takes. Two and a, at least two and a half hours, so I don't think you can finish early. So, suppose in another universe, Shakespeare and Einstein go to school together. Fantasy. <laughs> they each have two sets of homework to complete, mathematics and English. Okay, now, how should they approach their homework? Einstein is good at math, but poor in English. Oh, okay, and then I mean, this is fantasy, so we have to just assume that's the case. Okay, while well, the opposite is true for Shakespeare. So Einstein is better at math, and Shakespeare is better in English, at least Shakespeare in English. So. They can each do their own homework, but that's not a very smart way of doing things. A much better way would be for them to screw up their homework, right? Like Einstein can probably complete two sets of mathematics homework much quicker than he can complete one set of English homework. So we just swap, right? So that's trade. That's fair. I do your English homework and you do my mathematics homework for me, right? That's great. So, the idea that there's room for trade when each individual is good at something different is knocked by Adam Smith. Adam Smith, as you might know, is what is usually credited as the father of, of modern economics. So, he published his Wealth of Nations in 1776. Do you know how long that is? 1776? 1776 is before the United States became a country, right? Before the independence. So he has this idea called the absolute advantage. It's the ability to produce a good using fewer inputs than another producer. So I am better than math, I am better than math. You are better than English, and I have absolute advantage in math, and you have absolute advantage in mathematics. Not in English. Right? So absolute advantage means strictly better. I am strictly better than you in doing something. So I have the absolute advantage. So now, here's the part where we get into more standard textbook treatment. Because who else would use meat and potatoes as the two possible only two goods in the world? Only in the textbook will you do that. And on, for that matter, it has to be a Western textbook. Because if this is a Chinese textbook, it would be. Chicken and rice, something like that. 
you need to meet them for data science. Okay? And only two people, rancher and farmer. Rancher and farmer. So before you say the model is completely unrealistic, how, how the world contains more than two people in two groups. Now, models are supposed to be simple. Models should only cons contain enough detail to make people understand what you mean. Other things are just unnecessary details. So for our purpose, two people, two products would be sufficient for us to explain what's happening here. So the rancher and the farmer can produce meat and potatoes. The rancher can produce three ounces of meat or six ounces of potatoes. And the farmer can produce one ounce of meat or four ounces of potatoes. Now notice that, so if you, know, if you think about it, okay. I think pretty graphics makes people less likely to fall asleep. So you know, the potatoes, the potatoes are smiling at you. So. <coughs> Notice that the rancher is actually better at producing both products. This is different from what Adam Smith has in mind. So we're already moving past Adam Smith. Adam Smith has been, what Adam Smith has in mind is what we just talked about. Einstein is better at math. It's good at math. Uh, Shakespeare is good at English. They each have what they have. They have each have something that they do very well. That's what that's what uh, Adam Smith has in mind. What we have now is already past what Adam Smith has considered. Namely, you actually have one individual that is strictly better at everything than another. This, well, we have to consider that because this does happen in the real world, right? If you think about your secondary school, right? You, you obviously have a student, you, very many students will have a student who is, the, who is excelled at every single subject. The star student, the valedictorian. He's better at everything. Similarly, in the real world, you have countries, say the United States, that has better, better, potentially better technology at producing almost every item. Does that mean there is, there is no room for trade? Does that mean that the United States should just mind its own business? So in this case, in our question would be, should the rancher do everything by himself, given that he's faster than the farmer in every single item? To think, to think about that, let's put how much food each of them can produce in a day. Uh, eight hours, right? Eight hours. And we're going to put it on a diagram uh, with meat on the vertical axis and potatoes on the horizontal axis. Now, once again, this setting makes it very clear. This is a Western textbook. Eight hours working day. That doesn't exist in Hong Kong. <laughs> Multiply that by two, you get something more realistic. Such graphs are called production possibility frontiers. And they look like that, right? So let's say for the farmer. If the farmer focuses all his effort in producing meat, he can produce one ounce of meat per hour. For eight hours, he can produce eight. He can produce four ounces of potatoes per hour. For eight hours, he can produce 32. Join them by a line, you get what you can possibly, possibly produce. Now, every, every point on this blue line can be produced by the farmer, right? And every line on this blue line for the rancher, notice it's higher because the rancher is faster. You can produce 24 ounces of meat in eight hours and 42 eight ounces of potatoes in eight hours. So he has a higher line, he can produce more. The line indicates what is possible, which is why it's called a production possibility frontier. Inside the line, inside the line, um, you can produce, but that would be a kind of a waste of time because you have some time left, you're not doing anything. Outside, it would be invisible. You can't produce outside. You don't have enough time. Without trade, the farmer and the rancher each have to choose a combination of meat and potatoes they want to produce by themselves. Somewhere, so they're going to have to pick something in between, right? They to pick something. So, uh, okay, I'm just going to pick two points at random because in the past, students will ask why these two points, and I, the answer is absolutely no reason. Any point would do. Just pick two. Okay? Just pick two. So I'm going to pick these two. Four, sixty. So the farmer 
has decided um, he wants four units of meat and 16 units of potatoes. And the rancher decides that he wants twenty. He wants twelve ounces of meat and twenty-four ounces of potato. Um, the only thing that you uh, that I think is important to mention is is that notice that I try to pick a point where they have some of everything. That's the unusual assumption that we make in economics that people like a combination of things rather than just maximizing the amount you get for one single item, right? If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You don't spend all the money buying clothes and not buying shoes. You don't do that. So people do like do usually buy things in combinations. And if you add what they have together, four plus throughout is sixteen, and sixteen plus twenty-four is forty. So that's what you have in this economy. This is a very tiny economy where they in total have sixteen ounces of meat and forty ounces of potato, and they use up all the time. What if we ask the farm to focus on producing potatoes and the rancher to focus on producing meat? Can they do better if they focus on one of the two items? Why should I ask the farmer to focus on potatoes? If you look at it, the farmer is actually relatively better at potatoes, right? He can if one he is producing he is producing for one for every one ounce of meat he gives up he can get four ounces of potato that's one to four one to four for the rancher for every three ounces of meat he gives up he gets six ounces of potato that's one to two in some sense the farmer is relatively better in potatoes another way of looking at it the rancher is three times faster than the farmer in producing meat right three to one but he's only one and a half, I mean, he's only like 50% faster in producing potatoes. So once again, the farmer is relatively better in producing potatoes than meat. He's really bad at meat in producing meat. All right, so that's the trade-off I just mentioned. Notice that we can express this in terms of opportunity cost. Whenever the rancher wants to produce two ounces of meat, whenever the rancher wants to produce one ounce, sorry, whenever the rancher wants to produce one ounce of meat, he has to give up two ounces of potato. That's opportunity cost. Even though we don't have money here, you can still talk about cost. Ultimately, money is a medium of exchange. What we care about is what we get, right? You don't, un, uh, so, uh, like, unless you are the, that character in this, the Disney cartoon, like the Donald Duck's uncle or something, right? Oh, no, what's, his, what's his name? I don't remember, I should show, yeah. Well, whoever, that, that, that duck that's, that the duck that swims in money. Otherwise, most people do not take money as the end of the, the actual objective. You earn money because you want to use the money to buy things you want. So similarly, so even though we are in an economy without money, we don't, we can still talk about cost. And the cost of one ounce of meat for the rancher is two ounces per year. For the farmer, well, the cost of one ounce of meat is much heavier, four ounces of potato. He's so slow in producing meat, he gives up a lot of potato. Okay, All right, two each. Now, if you frame it this way, take a look if, like, as a whole, the economy as a whole, the, if the farm, if the rancher produced one ounce more meat, the farmer produced one ounce less meat, the difference cancel out in the so when you look at the society as a whole, right? You produce more, I produce less, we, that we cancel out each other. But that's free, that, that free the two of them to do something else, right? When the farmer is producing less meat, he can produce four ounces more potato. And the rancher, on the other hand, is only producing two ounces less potato. So the economy as a whole, you're gaining two ounces of potatoes out of nowhere by asking the rancher to produce more meat and the farmer to produce more potatoes. Now let's push this to the extreme. We ask the farmer only to produce potatoes. He's, he's not supposed to do anything else but to produce potatoes. And the rancher, we're going to ask him to produce some, mostly meat, but also some potatoes. Now we add up the two. 
30, the farmer produces 32 ounces of potatoes, plus the 12 ounces of potatoes produced by the rancher, they get 44, and the rancher produces 18 ounces of meat. And that's strictly more than 16 and 40, right? So, by focusing on what they do best, on what they do best, you manage to produce more of everything. No one wants to just eat potatoes. So you have to train. The farmer in particular would not agree to this deal unless he's, he can get meat in some way. So you have to train. Now I'm just going to propose trading 5 ounces of meat for 15 ounces of potatoes. So what, does that have, what would happen? The farmer would get 5 ounces of meat and 17 ounces of potato he, because he produced 32. You minus 15, you get 17. And the rancher would get the rancher would get 18 minus 5 equals to 13 ounces of meat and 12 minus plus 15 equals to 27 ounces of potato. Once again, well, it, there turns out there's a way of trading that would make both of them better off. Now, we already know trade is beneficial, right? Adam Smith knows that. And that's like in 1776, he already knows that. The difference is what Adam Smith didn't realize, at least something that he didn't he didn't wrote down explicitly, is that there's actually benefit to trade, even if one individual or one entity is strictly inferior to the other entity in every single way. That's something Adam Smith have not written down. And that's possible because, because now we have the insight of opportunity cost. When you do something, you have to give up something else. When you, even if you are really good at every single thing, you still, you, you still face trade-off. You can't do everything at the same time. So, this is the idea of comparative advantage. So, trade can happen when, even when one individual is better than every, is better at everything than another. This idea is proposed by its country. Uh, is um, is usually uh, contributed uh, to uh, David Ricardo. David Ricardo, who is so is uh, I think a uh, British, a uh, British. And this, as I said, comes from the ability to produce a good and low opportunity cost. And it's all about what you give up. Uh, when you do, when you try to do, when you try to produce meat, are you giving up your ability to produce a lot of potatoes? If you do, then you have a high opportunity cost. One person can have absolute advantage in all, in everything, but not comparative advantage in everything. And this is very easy to think because, let's say you think about. Once again, let's think about this, a star student again. Okay? Now, a student can be better than all his classmates in English. He can be better than all his classmates in mathematics. That's possible. In fact, in Hong Kong, we like to we like we like to report those people, right? Every year during GSE year results announcement, <coughs> well, students who manage to get A's in every single subject would go on in English. So there are students who do better than, every, than his classmates in every single subject. So you can so that's possible. But what's impossible is that the student cannot be better at English than mathematics, and at the same time better than better in English. So wait a minute, which way should I go? Okay, a student cannot be better in English than mathematics, while at the same time better at mathematics than English. That's logically impossible, right? When you're talking about relatively, relative performance, you can only be relatively better in one of the two items. You can't be relatively better in both items. So, because of this logical impossibility, you have you can only be relatively you you can only be relatively better in a limited number of things. You can either be better in English than mathematics. Or you could be better in mathematics than English. You can't be both. That gives room for trade. Let's we can each focus on what we are relatively better at.
So, principle four is strain is beneficial when there's scarcity. It happens every day. Highly marked up iPads on second-hand markets allow people, people to exchange time for money. Who lines up for iPhone in Hong Kong? Well, obviously, there are some people who really like iPhones, but that's not the only people who line up for iPhones. We have a lot of grandmas lining up for iPhones. Now, grandmas don't need iPhones. They, what they need is the money. So the grandma lines up for iPhones, and what grandma has, oh yeah, what grandma has a lot is time. So the grandma wakes up early in the morning, earlier than any of the young people. They love to do this. They go line up in front of an electronic store and buy the iPhones. Then they sell them. They're exchanging time for money. Well, who, well, and the market exists because there are people willing to exchange money for time. I'm willing to pay a high price so that I don't need to wait in line. The existence of stock market allows people who are willing to pay to buy from people willing to sell. You buy, I sell. Just name a the price. There is the issue of equity that would come up sometimes. In the case of iPhone, there are people who think it's very unfair that people get to resell iPhones when they don't really want one. Right? So should we sell in Japan? And think about Share. Uh, something that you will learn later on in the course I'll show you is that now investment return is how rich people, like especially the ultra rich, like what we call what the one of them, uh, gets most of the income from. Not from salary. Most the rich like rich people usually get most of the income from investment. They hold most of the stocks in the in a given market and they earn most of the return. Is that fair? Should everyone get a share of Tencent? Maybe we should just spread. Like in Hong Kong, we have some of that, right? In Hong Kong, we have this, uh, well, the government issued I bonds, which give you basically um, inflation links, uh, inflation mark return. So you, you, so you at least get inflation return. It's pretty much kind of like a free, it's like a free lunch from government. Everyone who applies pretty much get one. And it, does the government need money? No, the government doesn't need borrow money. It's kind of like really just like free lunch given out by the government for every citizen, paid by tax dollars anyway. So equity is an issue. Who gets to who gets to do what? Um, in economics, we rarely mention equity. You will see that we mention a lot more about efficiency, how whether they are whether things are being done efficiently. Uh, but then you have to keep in mind efficient. Uh, Equity sometimes would be of for example in this example. Several years ago, HSBC Hong Kong decided to eliminate 3,000 positions from back office operations and middle, middle management. Okay. So HSBC decided to move these positions to mainland. So let's think about this this way. Once upon a time you have HSBC shareholders and back office <coughs> workers in Hong Kong, and then now, you have HSBC, back office workers in Hong Kong, and back office workers in mainland. <coughs> we say that trade is good, but do the back office workers in Hong Kong necessarily gain in the transition from one to two? So that you go from a situation where you have just Hong Kong workers to a situation where you have Hong Kong workers and mainland workers. Does, is that good? To think about that, let's use back this farm and rancher example. Um, so notice that uh, this time around, I have two farms. I, what I have done is that I map out all the I map basically map out the production possibility frontiers in numbers, right? The rancher can produce at most forty eight potatoes and the rent uh, and twenty four meat. Now, farmer one is the previous farmer. Farmer two is a new farmer, and notice farmer two. Is equally bad as farmer one in producing meat, but he's faster in producing potatoes. Right? He can produce uh, 40 ounces of potatoes right, instead of 32. If you are the renter, who would you trade with? Who would you trade with? If you're finding a partner to do a project, do you find some? Do you want to find someone who is 
relatively good at doing things, or do you want to find someone who is very lazy? Or do you want to find someone who is good at doing, good at doing things, right? So it's the same idea here. The rancher obviously wants to find a trading partner that is very quick in producing potatoes. And that's farmer too. If nothing, we can at least get a better deal, right? Farmer two is producing so much potato, he can, he, he can offer the rancher more potatoes for his meat. So in this situation, the rancher would trade with farmer two. It's just natural. You can trade now. The trade-off here, if you calculate, uh, the trade-off here is, let's see. We mentioned before, for the rancher is uh, one to, uh, one meat for two potatoes, right? For the farmer is one meat for four potatoes. For farmer two, it's, if the trade is one to five. So, in other words, farmer two is willing to pay up to five potatoes for the rancher's meat. Whereas for farmer two, one, he's willing to pay only pay four potatoes for the rancher's meat. So the rancher obviously is going to trade with farmer two. What happens to farmer one? So the rancher trades with farmer two. What happens to a farmer one? Can farmer one trade with the, 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 as, as we already mentioned, the rancher is not going to trade with farmer one. Can the farmer one trade with farmer two? Well, you have to think about whether farmer two wants to trade with farmer one, right? Now, if farmer one is to trade with farmer two, he has to be producing meat. But why wouldn't why wouldn't farmer two buy meat from rancher from the rancher instead? So this is a situation where farmer two, farmer one have no have nothing that he's relatively good at, right? Farmer two is relatively good at producing potatoes. Far, the rancher is relatively good at producing meat. Farmer one is relatively good at nothing. So which means he might not get to trade at all. No one wants to trade with him. Uh, in economics, sometimes we, if you have no one to trade, you work, you just produce everything yourself. We call that uh, home. Uh, we call that like home employment. We call that home employment, right? Which is another way to say that farmer one is kind of unemployed, right? He's not really working for anyone. So. Now, he, what we have here is a situation where the farmer one is worse off, because as we say, as we just as we just saw, if farmer one was able to trade with the rancher, he's actually better off; he can get more. But he's now not trading, which means he's back in the situation where he's just producing everything himself, making him worse off. We have a situation where farmer one is now worse off in, in the <coughs> under trade. Right? We have a farmer one worse off on the trade. Why? This is a question. So this is a question I want to ask you before we end. Is how come that if you think about this situation, this is really this is really like a simplified free a simplified free trade situation. This is kind of farmer two is like China. China enters the global market with cheap labor. Farmer one is like developed countries workers. They suffer because they can't compete with cheap labor from China. They they get they get fired, unemployed, worse off. But we just said that trade is beneficial when there's equity. So what's the, what's the, what's what's the problem here? Now what I want you to think about is there's actually there's actually an assumption that I make in this example that make the farmer worse farm that make it possible for farmer one to be worse off. What the, in, so what assumption did I make that make farmer one worse off in this situation? To help you think about this issue, let's think about yourself. 
let's imagine you are in the un, you are in the unfortunate situation where you get fired. What would you do? What you, what should people do when they get fired? I hope you don't sit at home and do nothing and just play Pokemon Go. <laughs> Um, you should be looking for you should look, you should probably was look for another job, right? <coughs> look for another job. What can what kind of is there another job farmer one can do here? There's nothing, right? If you he can't be a he can't grow he can't produce meat because the rancher is better for producing meat. He can't produce potatoes for, and well he can't produce for someone else because he's because farm two is better at producing potatoes. What I assume here is that there are only two jobs for free people, right? There are only two products for free people. So that makes Farmer 2, that makes Farmer 1 relatively good at nothing. There are fewer products than people. If we have another product, for example, clothing, in that case, if you have clothing, Rancher will focus on meat, Farmer 2 will focus on potatoes, and farmer one would become a tailor. He's going to focus on clothing. That would make him employed, and that would make the whole economy better again. So it comes down to the assumption: here. Are there jobs for? Are there enough jobs for people? Switch this. That's an assumption that is very new world relevant. Think about think about in manufacturing workers. If you are a 45 year old manufacturing worker, do you think you can switch to become a programmer? Oh, it's very difficult, right? 45, if you're a manufacturing, if you're a manufacturing worker, 45 years old, it's very hard for you to pick up new skills. That would may, so that maybe <coughs> would mean you have no, you would be, you would be unable to find a new job. That would be a situation where there are fewer jobs than the number of people available. So that's an assumption. In an analysis, and you have to think about assumptions whether assumptions are correct. Generally, in economics, a lot of the results would depend on the assumptions you make, and assumptions are very often hidden, either hidden in in words, in diagrams, in tables, or it could be hidden in mathematics. You have, as an economist, you have to think about whether the assumptions make sense or not. In the case of, in, of manufacturing workers in developed countries, I think it does make sense to say that some of the workers um, would not be able to switch to another occupation. But for, say, a fresh graduate in university, I think it would, be very, it would not be an accurate description. You, are, you should be able to switch occupations. Summary, principle one, scarcity means straight off. Principle two, cost is what you have given up. Three, principle three, think at a margin, think incrementally. And four, trade is beneficial when there's scarcity. And I think that's the end of Yeah, that's the end of the day. We're gonna do this next time. Right? So we'll see you all on Thursday.